King Zwangandaba led an exodus that established the Ngoni kingdoms in Zambia, Malawi, and Tanzania. The migration of the Ngoni people that began in 1822 and spread northwest from Zululand to what is now Zimbabwe and northward to what is now Malawi and Tanzania. 200 years later, the Ngoni who have settled in these nations are still known for their lengthy migration, warfare, creation of new kingdoms throughout their trek and the role they played in the histories of the nations they now inhabit. Uzwangandaba Kaziguda, Jaili was born around 1785, the son of Shlachwayo Kamagangata, and was the king of the Ngoni people for more than 30 years, from approximately 1815 to his death in 1848. He was the older brother of Usomkanda Kaziguda Jele, who was also known as Gumbi, and founded the Gumbi clan in KwaZulu-Natal in areas of Pongola. The history of the Ngoni people, as descended from Zwangandaba, took place during the Mfetsane, period of widespread was in southern Africa. Shaka, the powerful Zulu king, expanded his influence by conquering neighboring tribes. In the process, he came into conflict with Zwide Kalanga, another powerful king who adopted similar military tactics to Shaka. Eventually, Shaka defeated Zwide in battle in 1820. However, Zwide had several allies under his leadership, including the Abengoni, led by Zwangandaba. Following this defeat, Uzwangandaba, along with his followers, who at the time were known as Abengoni and other leaders like Soshangana decided to flee northward. Taking with him as many women, children and cattle as he could, Zwangandaba strove to escape Shaka's vengeance. Zwangandaba and his followers entered Swaziland, now Eswatini, where they were welcomed by Sobuza I. During the early stages of this trek, Zwangandaba's younger brother, Somkanda, was left behind during the crossing of the Embaluzi River, which had flooded for two days without subsiding. Somkanda later decided to return to Zululand under a new name, disguising himself and his followers to avert Shaka's wrath. Today, the descendants of Somkanda are known as the Gumbi clan, while the rest of Zwangandaba's descendants retained the name Jele or Jere. Clan surnames are important in Nguni culture as they tell the story of a clan's origins and history, the clan's position in society and its relationship to other clans. Thus, Somkanda's decision to name himself and his followers Gumbi afforded them anonymity as this was a non-existent clan name at the time. Swangandaba was not the kind of leader who could long tolerate living in the shadow of another king. After a few years in Swaziland under Sobhuza's rule, he decided to continue his journey to the area that is now southern Mozambique. There his army established a reputation after winning several scuffles against the Portuguese settlers. As he continued northward, Zwangandaba clashed with the Amatonga, a tribe in his path. During their earlier interactions with the Tonga people, Zwangandaba's followers had incorporated many of them into their regiments and their families. This assimilation process had significantly increased the numbers of the Ngoni people. He fought his way through them as he pressed on to the north. He reached the sea at Lorenco Marques, now Maputo. It was while he lived with the Tonga that his people came to be known as the Angoni. Zwangandaba eventually joined Soshangana Kazikode, who had also fled from Shaka at the same time as him, and he became second in command to Soshangana. Soshangani was the founder and first king of the Gazankulu Empire, which at the height of its power stretched over modern-day southern Mozambique and parts of Pumalanga and Limpopo provinces in South Africa. In 1826 or 1827, Zwangandaba and Soshangana jointly defeated the Portuguese at Lorenzo Marques. Zwangandaba's influence began to attract people who were fleeing Shaka, who had become notoriously tyrannical after the death of his mother Nandi in 1827. These defections led a nervous Shaka to invade Zwangandaba's territory and a Zulu military regiment sent by Shaka caught up with them. The force had just about reached its limit through fever and hunger. 
and Zwangandaba was able to stave off their attack. Not daring to rest as long as Shaka could reach him, Zwangandaba decided to move on again. Soshangana and his people stayed in the region of Delagoa Bay until 1828, when Soshangana defeated Shaka's army. Mishlaba, the brother of Soshangana, expressed his willingness to accompany Zwangandaba on the journey westward, as there were tensions between the brothers. The relationship between Zwangandaba and Soshangane was also strained due to mutual jealousy, and so Mishlaba Wadabuka, the younger brother of Soshangane, joined Zwangandaba and the Ngoni people on their march towards Zimbabwe. He passed through what is called Pumalanga in present-day South Africa. Crossing the Limpopo River, Zwangandaba's group entered the territory of the Rotsvi people located in present-day Zimbabwe. During this phase of his travels, Zwangandaba's group engaged in conquest and assimilated some of the local populations, including the Karanga, Manyika, Zezuru and Korekore people. This process involved the assimilation of these diverse groups into Zwangandaba's expanding community. The diverse group led by Zwangandaba ventured into the western hills in the direction of Mzilikazi Kamashobane, hoping to form an alliance with him. However, upon their arrival in Matabelaland, they did not get the reception they had anticipated. It is unclear whether Zwangandaba initiated an attack on a Mzilikazi or if Mzilikazi, threatened by potential competition, launched an attack against Zwangandaba. The exact circumstances leading to their confrontation are not well documented. Nevertheless, what is clear is that Mzilikazi and Zwangandaba clashed, regardless of their prior relationship where they were allies under Zwide prior his defeat by Shaka. In 1833, Zwangandaba's group entered the territory of the Rotsvi Mambo, or King Chirisamhuru. Here, they had another significant conflict with the last leader of the Rotsvi Empire, which, by many historical accounts, was weak due to their internal power struggles and ineffectual leadership. Successive attacks on the empire by the Mpanga, Nwane and Maseko had also weakened the Rotsvi. Zwangandaba's forces and the forces of Nyamazana, who was the Swazi niece of Zwangandaba, launched an attack on Mambo Chirisamhuru, who resided in a stone-built fortress at Manyanga, formerly known as Taba Sika Mambo. Nyamazana played a prolific role in this battle, as well as the politics of that region later on. I'll make a video about her soon. Please subscribe to Africa Enchanted and turn on your notifications for when it lands. But for now, back to Zwangandaba and the history of the Ngoni people. Zwangandaba's tactics effectively trapped the Rotsvi within their fortress. Zwangandaba's forces defeated the Rotsvi with significant casualties and managed to capture Chirisamhuru alive. Tragically, Chirisamhuru was subjected to a gruesome fate, being skinned alive a few days after his capture. Other historical accounts state that it was the Swazi forces of Queen Nyamazana who ultimately killed Chirisamhuru and burnt his capital. Following their victory over the Rotsvi, Zwangandaba's group settled in the newly conquered territory. And eventually, Zwangandaba made the decision to move again and in late 1835, Swangandaba reached the Zambezi River somewhere between Sena and Tete and commenced preparations for crossing the river. On 20 November in the season of Chiganyane, when the Zambezi River was at its lowest at the height of the dry season, Zwangandaba crossed the Zambezi River. Mishlaba Wadabuka, the brother of Soshangana, who had earlier decided to leave his brother in Mozambique and cross the Limpopo with Zwangandaba, decided not to cross the Zambezi River and remained on the south bank and raided the Portuguese. Moving downstream past Tete, Mishlaba settled between Sena and the mouth of the Zambezi River and set about overpowering the Tonga of that neighborhood. In the long praise poem about Zwangandaba, the event of the Zambezi crossing is recounted. Tradition has it on the day the migration occurred, there was a total eclipse of the sun. It is said that Zwangandaba struck the waters with a stick, 
and this act parted the waters, and he crossed over with his people. This event often has been likened to the parting of the Red Sea. Another more plausible account about the Zambezi River crossing is documented by historians as follows. The warriors formed a living chain by linking arms and wading into the river, intending to reach the opposite bank. The water in the river was not particularly deep, typically no deeper than waist deep. Women and children crossed the river above the human chain, using it for support and stability. They crossed successfully but found it very challenging to do so with their livestock, so most of it was left behind. Previously, when Zwangandaba and his group had entered the territories of the Amatonga, the Rotsvi and Amakaranga, they encountered people who primarily fought using throwing spears and bows and arrows. These groups lacked the structured military organization of the Nguni that Zwangandaba was accustomed to. However, he incorporated many of these groups into his tribe. By the time they reached the Zambezi River, Zwangandaba's regiments began losing some of their Ngoni military discipline, and they were adapting to the fighting styles of the local peoples. As they crossed the Zambezi River, Zwangandaba's primary motive shifted from moving away from conflict using the stabbing spear to finding a region suitable for cattle farming. He showed a desire for less military conquest and a focus on the accumulation of cattle, which was a symbol of wealth and status for the Ngoni people, as was the case with all Nguni groups. As we discuss this new phase of the Ngoni trek, I feel it is important to provide additional details that give insight into the complex familial and social structures within the group. These explain some of the reasons why the group split after Zwangandaba's death years later. At this point, the ruling house of Zwangandaba consisted of him and his younger brother Ntabeni, representing the Shlachwayo house. And so, Ntabeni's son would also contest for leadership after Zwangandaba's passing. Previously, during their settlement in the Barosvi territory near Tabasikamambo around 1833, Zwangandaba's wife named Sosea gave birth to a son named Mupezeni, also known as Ntutu. Mupezeni was Zwangandaba's eldest son, but not the son of his great wife, Loziwawa. The two women were sisters and co-wives, among other wives from other tribes. Zwangandaba had other children from his other wives as well. These details provide insights into the complex familial and social structures within the group because after Zwangandaba, a succession battle would take place and it would split the Ngoni apart. However, that won't be discussed in great detail in this video as the complications of Zwangandaba's line of succession would require its own video. Upon entering the Nsenga country, north of the Zambezi River, Zwangandaba settled near the village of Makoko. Here, Zwangandaba and his group rested for approximately five years, and during this period, many future chiefs of the Ngoni people were born. During their stay among the Nsenga people, Zwangandaba adopted elements of their culture and practices. Additionally, the Nsenga traditional doctors known as Singanga were incorporated into the tribe. The customs and discipline of the Ngoni were undergoing changes during this time. Young men were becoming more independent and rebellious. In the Nsenga country, the practice of circumcision and ritual seclusion had faded as young men engaged in relationships with Nsenga women before reaching the age of initiation and circumcision. This practice was consistent with what had already occurred in the south back in Zululand due to Shaka banning the circumcision of the Zulu people as his main priority was military conquest and having a shortage of young men complicated his plan. In the Nsenga territory, Zwangandaba also worked on rebuilding his cattle herds, capturing the small humpbacked cattle of the Amaravi tribes of which the Nsenga were a part. He also assimilated many Nsenga men and women into the Ngoni tribe one of these captives, named Chiwere, rose to a high position in the Ngoni regiments and was granted the right to adopt the clan name of Indlovu. Chiwere later broke away from the Ngoni and led Nsenga-born regiments in Malawi. 
Between 1840 and 1845, Zhuang and Daba settled at Mabili, near Mbangweni, in present-day Malawi. However, since the economy of the Ngoni, like that of the rest of the Nguni, revolved around healthy and abundant cattle, he was drawn to another trek when he heard of the exciting existence of the Niamwezi, long-horned cattle breed, known as Izinkomo Zamapembe. Thus, he resumed his trek northwards, where he finally settled among the Fipa people in present-day Tanzania. He named his settlement Kapital Mapupo, which translates to Land of His Dreams. In 1845, in Tanzania, they fought the Ufipa people to establish a territory for themselves. During one of these battles, Zwangandaba was injured by a poisoned arrow, causing his warriors to retreat back south. They camped near Tongola Hill and used herbs to try to cure their leader, but Zwangandaba died. He was buried in Mapupo, near Ufipa, Tanganyika. It is here that Zwangandaba lies buried today after having fled his enemy Shaka and having led his people over 6,000 kilometers on foot. After his death, the Ngoni people further split up under the leadership of his sons, Pezaini, and Perembe and Mbelwa, and continued their journeys. A fourth group under Zulugama also split from the Ngoni. Those who went north of Mapupo avoided the name Ngoni, possibly due to the negative legacy of the conquest that had marked the Ngoni trek. This group has since been assimilated into local ethnic groups. Some are known as Watuwa, and some in Kenya are called Abaluya. Others spread into the present-day Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda and bear surnames like Shonga and Chere, Fajele. The second group went west and settled in the eastern region of Zambia under King Mapezeni. The third group, under Mambelwa, headed south into the Mzimba district of Malawi. Lastly, the fourth group, under Zulu Gama, journeyed on from Mzimba to the Ruvuma region of Tanzania and has its headquarters at Songia. The Ngoni migration, led by King Zwangandaba, stands as a testament to human resilience and adaptability. Uzwangandaba and his followers embarked on an arduous journey that spanned thousands of kilometers and several decades. Along the way, they encountered diverse cultures, faced numerous challenges, and adapted to new environments. The Ngoni migration played a pivotal role in shaping the cultural identity of the Ngoni people. As they settled among various tribes and integrated elements of local cultures, often through violent conquest, they forged a unique identity that blended their Nguni Jele origins with the customs and practices of the regions they traversed. The legacy of King Zwangandaba and the Ngoni migration endures in the regions they settled. The Ngoni migration's impact is seen in cultural practices, social structures, and even clan names that reflect their complex journey. Their influence extended beyond their immediate territories, leaving an indelible mark on the histories and societies of present-day Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania, and other neighboring areas. Some of the other prominent historical figures mentioned in the Ngoni migration are Zwide Kalanga, Shaka Zulu, Soshangana Kazikode, Mzilikazi Kamashobane, and Sobuza I. Videos on all of them are already on the Africa Enchanted channel, please check them out. And don't forget to hit the notification bell for when the Queen Nyamazana video drops. Thank you for your support, don't forget to like and subscribe.